Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Now, I wish to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. We took a recess Friday to interview Richard Bennett, so we're picking up where we left off last Thursday. And since we've had the uh, the interview with Richard Bennett and also the weekend, I'll uh, kind of recap a little bit to kind of put you in the mind for what we're going to read this morning. First of all, because of the decree of papal infallibility by the First Vatican Council in 1870, there were authoritative Roman Catholic Church sources and periodicals the most authoritative Roman Catholic sources in the country were going around proclaiming this papal infallibility and what it really meant to Roman Catholics. What it was to mean to Roman Catholics was that the Pope, like God, was infallible. The infallible representative of God on the earth. Now, for those Roman Catholics that accepted that the Pope is the head of the Roman Catholic Church and is the governor of the Roman Catholic Church, it was asserted that in order for him freely to govern the Roman Catholic Church in every country in the world where it exists, he must also have the temporal power, a temporal power that, it, that usurps the power of government itself, the secular government that any government of the world that passed any law that in any way hindered his spiritual and temporal power to govern Catholics wherever they live should be overthrown. And a Roman Catholic system of government replace, uh, to replace it, uh, uh, laws passed that enhance the Pope's ability to govern the church in the country. In other words, in essence, in essence, to make the governments of the world Catholic. And this author, R.W. Thompson, warns that this is precisely the effect that it has had in the United States of America, that Catholics, recognizing for the first time many of, in many cases, what the decree of papal infallibility really meant, came to the stark realization that the papal form of government is directly counter to the Protestant form of government which our Constitution establishes, our Constitution and Bill of Rights. So they found themselves in direct contradiction or directly opposed to the very foundational documents of our country that the Constitution of the United States and our entire form of government needed to be little by little Catholicized. And part of that part of that transformation to the Catholic form of government would be to eliminate a government of, by, and for the people and replace it with a government by divine right. That is, returning to the old world order, wherein the Pope picked all the kings, and they served him. And they served at his behest. And they put down the people and made them subjects. Quite a different set of circumstances than what we enjoy here in the United States, where the people are free to think, and to reason, and to govern themselves. Now, with that background, we must understand, once again, that the most powerful and influential and authoritative sources of the Roman Catholic Church in this country were inciting a rebellion of Roman Catholics against our government to transform our government from the Protestant principle to the Roman Catholic principle. And now the author gives us an example comparing those people of the United States who are in direct rebellion against our government with 
the same type of citizens in Germany who also responded in like manner to the decree of papal infallibility and now seeing that their government was at direct odds with their papacy and choosing their religion and their church and their pope over the government, they openly rebelled against the laws of the civil government. Now, with that preface, we'll begin on the, the uh, second full paragraph on page 175. R.W. Thompson compares these two groups, the American group of rebels and the German group of rebels. He says, wherein does the difference consist in principle between them, that is, the United States Roman Catholics, and those citizens of Germany who have been so highly extolled for their resistance to the laws of their government? The particular measures of civil policy which have invited the resistance are not alike, but the principle is the same in all cases. It is neither more nor less than opposition to law, because it affects the Roman Catholic Church by denying that the Pope has any right, either divine or human, to interfere with the domestic and temporal policy of the government. The Pope claims that by virtue of authority conferred upon him by divine providence, he has the spiritual right to release these disobedient citizens of Germany from any, uh, any allegiance to their own government, and that any resistance to this by that, by that government is a violation of God's law. So what we're talking about is papal-sanctioned rebellion against the government, a papally-sanctioned revolution against the lawfully established government of Germany. He continues, he says, he teaches that their first duty is to him. That is, the Pope teaches all Roman Catholics in Germany that their first duty is to him, the Pope, because he represents God. And that if, in paying this duty, they violate the laws of their state, that is, the German government, they stand justified before God because the spiritual order is above the temporal. All right, let's not miss the significance of that last phrase. Every Roman Catholic must, on pain of excommunication, recognize the spiritual authority of the Pope. And very few Roman Catholics would argue with that in principle, that the Roman Catholic Church must respond to the Pope like men must respond to Christ. That's the spiritual component of the Pope's power. Now, by consequence, the spiritual is higher than the civil. So the spiritual power of the Pope ascends above and lords over the civil power. The civil powers must respond to the spiritual power of the Pope. Now, and thus the Pope erects an ecclesiastical government within the temporal, demanding obedience upon the ground that God did not design that the Pope should be subject to any civil power on earth. Now, let's talk about this a moment. Thus the Pope erects an ecclesiastical government. Have you ever heard the term shadow government before? Has anybody ever defined it for you? R.W. Thompson just did, and he is on the exact same page as was Admiral Manhattan in his book, The Vatican Billions. There is a shadow government, not only in the United States, but every government on the earth. And it is a shadow government hidden in plain sight, and it is organized, it is broke down into districts, much like we, uh, the civil power is broke down into districts, like city, county, and state governments. What I'm talking about, and what R.W. Thompson is talking about specifically, in parallel with that 
city, state, uh, uh, county, uh, city, state, county, and and uh, national governments is the local priest, the local bishop, the local archbishop, and the cardinal. And the, the land, as we look at a map, is broken up into uh, city limits, county borders, and state borders. And you can think of the Roman Catholic shadow government as not visible on the map, but it's, it, it's arranged in the same way. It has its jurisdictions, and over each jurisdiction is a Roman Catholic hierarch, whether you be the priest at the local city level, in some cases the neighborhood level, and then we have the bishop is over several of these localities, and then the archbishop over all. And the cardinal is the direct link to the papacy. This shadow government was spelled out for us in detail by Avril Manhattan in his book, The Vatican Billions. I highly recommend you get that book and read it. And it will shed more light on what R.W. Thompson is talking about here. He says the Pope erects an ecclesiastical government within the temporal, meaning the civil government, demanding obedience upon the ground that God did not design that the Pope should be subject to any civil power on earth. So if you are to, to understand, as we do, that this country, that this government was laid out to serve the people, and that the people were the ultimate authority, and it is represented by the civil power, local, county, state, and federal, you have a parallel government that's scattered and peeled just like the civil power, and they are at odds with one another. And as long as the people maintain their liberty, they can resist this spiritual power of the Pope, this shadow government of the Pope. But when the people become lethargic and inattentive, and become less and less aware of this shadow ecclesiastical government, then the shadow ecclesiastical government gains the ascendancy, and they do it on the grounds of the spiritual authority of God, which they claim is manifested in the Pope. And that is the case in America today. And you'll see all of this talk about the unity of Christians, this ecumenical movement. I want my listeners to understand what power that and authority and legitimacy and ultimate control that that places upon this shadow government of the Roman Catholic priests. Now, who in their right minds could argue against the ascendancy of Christianity in this country? Certainly not me, but it must be a Christianity based on the Bible and based on Christ, not on Roman Catholic canon law and the biblical and historical Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. This R.W. Thompson understood, and this is what prompted him to write this book. He saw the gravest threat to our democratic, rather Protestant form of government as that shadow government of ecclesiastical hierarchy that, wrote, that intended to raise the papacy not only to supremacy in the United States, but to use the United States militarily, economically, uh, diplomatically, and in every other way to force every other nation to acquiesce to this ecclesiastical government set up by the Pope when he set up his archdioceses and his dioceses and his local bishoprics. 
This is what's happening in the world. This is the new world order. If you want to put flesh and bones on the new world order, all you have to do is recognize what gives flesh and bone to this Roman Catholic ecclesiastical hierarchy, the shadow government in the, in the world. The Pope claims that no civil power on earth should have authority over him, that he is the the last and greatest authority on the earth, and that he has the divine right, divine providence to rule the world both in spiritual and in temporals. That means every Roman Catholic is commanded by God through the Pope to overthrow any government that stands in the way of the full and free and unfettered power and authority of the papacy. What the end product of that is, is the new world order. It's just the old world order restored. The the deadly wound is being healed. It has stopped its weeping. There's no need for bandages anymore. And there's barely a scar remaining. The New World Order is in place. R.W. Thompson warned us about it in the most explicit terms. He's giving us an example of how lauded and praised by the papacy that the German people were when they rose up against their Protestant government and sought to put the the Pope on the throne, both spiritual throne and the temporal throne of Germany. Now, I'll continue. He holds out the same justification to his followers in the United States, encouraging their opposition to principles of our government far more fundamental than any assailed in Europe, and rested upon the claim of divine power. As vicar of Christ, that is, as the replacement of the Son of God on earth, he dispenses the obligation of allegiance. In other words, he he relieves every Roman Catholic of any allegiance, any obligation of allegiance to their governments, and turns loose his ecclesiastical army, his shadow government, upon every government on the earth which dares to establish any constitution or pass any law or do any act that shall curtail the Pope's authority or that of his Roman Catholic priestly pedophilic hierarchy, I will just add the words, or shall prevent the papacy from becoming what he claims for it, the universal governing power. The universal governing power, not the local, the universal. And universal means what is implied here. Just as Satan said that he would exalt his throne above the stars of God, that he would sit upon the mount of the congregation in the side of the north, that he would be like the Most High, this universal power is over heaven, over earth, and over hell. He usurps the authority of God. He exercises that authority on earth. And he exercises that authority over what they call hell is purgatory. And only the Pope can release a soul from purgatory. So he's fulfilling Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 14, the Luciferian false prophecy. And we've read it many times on the broadcast. The papacy is indeed the human agency on earth, chosen, elevated, empowered to fulfill Satan's prophecy, Satan's false prophecy of Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15. The Pope's universal power Now, the author continues, he says, and writers like the author of the foregoing article in the Catholic world, perfectly obedient and submissive to him, that is the Pope, 
enter with alacrity upon the task of assailing the very fundamental principles of our government, as if the American people were either insensible to their, perfid, their perfidy or ready to become the passive dupes of their intrigues. The passive dupes. And that's what we are today. Passive in that we're so busy with our own private economic problems, our jobs, our family problems, that we just can't take anymore. So we're inattentive. And we just passively are led by the nose, led by our political leaders in this country. And we're dupes because we simply are uneducated. R.W. Thompson is trying to turn we American dupes into educated activists in order to protect our Protestant Constitution and our Protestant way of life. Now, continuing where we left off Thursday that these papal followers in the United States occupy a position substantially analogous to that of those in Germany who are justified by the Pope for resistance to the civil power is easily demonstrable. Take, for example, the relations between them and the governments of the empire. Before the unification of Germany, Prussia was a Protestant nation. Like all other Protestant nations, its laws gave equal protection to every denomination of Christians. Insofar as they protected the rights of conscience, they recognized no difference between the Lutheran and other Protestant churches and the Roman Catholic Church. That these papal followers in the United States occupy a position substantially analogous to that of those in Germany who are justified by the Pope for resistance to the civil power, is easily demonstrable. Take, for example, the relations between them and the government of the empire. Before the unification of Germany, Prussia was a Protestant nation. Like all other Protestant nations, Prussia had its, uh, uh, Prussia's laws gave equal protection to every denomination of Christians. Insofar as they protected the rights of conscience, they recognized no difference between the Lutheran and other Protestant churches and the Roman Catholic Church. Perfect freedom of faith and worship was not only conferred, but guaranteed to all. Education was compulsory, but each of the churches was permitted, in addition to the education required by the state, to impress the principles of its own faith upon the minds of the young who were under its charge. In the Roman Catholic schools, the religion of that church was taught without any prohibition by the state. Papal infallibility had not been yet decreed and consequently was not a necessary part of the Roman Catholic religion. It was undoubtedly maintained by the Jesuit or Ultramontane party, but this constituted so small a portion of the great body of the Roman Catholic Church in Prussia that the government was not disposed to hold it responsible as a whole for the doctrines of this party. Now, first of all, I want my listeners to recognize it was the Jesuits or the Ultramontane party of Prussia that upheld papal infallibility and led this rebellion of the Prussians against the civil government. The same is the case today. The Jesuits are in charge of overthrowing all governments that resist or in any way hinder the power of the Pope, which they have increased to the heights of the heavens. The Jesuits were the ones who raised the papacy to the, the status of infallibility. They were the ones who organized and created this, the First Vatican Council in 1870. 
they had too many horses to steer. So they put all the power in the Pope. All they have to do now is control the Pope, and they control the church. And their goal is to destroy Protestantism and to restore the old world order. Papal domination. That's the Jesuits and the Ultramontanes, those who hold this idea that the Pope is supreme on the earth and should have no competition, spiritually or temporally. That the Pope should reign, as it were, Christ on earth. Now, it was well understood that it, this Ultramontan this ultramontanism, this Jesuit idea that the Pope was supreme, it was well understood that it would elevate the Pope to a condition of supremacy over the state if the power to do so were given it. But it made so little progress in that direction on account of the natural tendency of the German mind toward freedom of thought as to excite no serious apprehensions on the part of the government. And consequently, under the Prussian kingdom, there was no attempt to interfere with the Roman Catholic schools or with the church or with the ecclesiastical jurisdiction. There's that shadow government again. Or with the ecclesiastical jurisdiction of its Roman Catholic hierarchy. This harmony was disturbed by two of the most important events of the present period the decree of papal infallibility, and the war between Prussia and France. And we're going to give that example of the war between Prussia and France, but let me tell you, the wars of the world are fought for the very purpose of raising the papacy to world supremacy. The underlying purpose of every war is to increase the jurisdiction of the papacy and to put down all of its resistance. We're going to give one example of the Prussian and French War. It says, These two events, the decree of papal infallibility and the war between Prussia and France, occurred so nearly together that there would seem to have been some intimate relationship between them. The war was designed on the part of Napoleon III to settle, to settle the superiority of the Latin over the Teutonic race and the decree to make the Pope supreme over all the nations. So far from the former of these objects having been accomplished, the contest resulted in German unification in not only converting the kingdom of Prussia into the German Empire, but in making it one of the strongest and most compact military powers in the world. Whether during the struggle there was any effort on the part of the ultramontane prelates and clergy to convert it into a religious war by persuading the Roman Catholics of Germany into the belief that the triumph of the true faith, that is Roman Catholicism, would inevitably follow the destruction of the Protestant government of Prussia does not bear especially upon our present inquiry. It is, however, the fact that after the close of the war, when the civil authorities entered upon the duty of consolidating the empire, they found that the effect of the decree of papal infallibility was to make the Roman Catholic religion in the empire a very different thing from what it had previously been in the kingdom. A considerable number of German prelates had voted non placid, in other words, against the decree of papal infallibility at the Lateran Council. But they were unable to resist the power and pressure of the papacy and yielded their assent under ultramontane dictation and threats, under Jesuit dictation and threats. The necessary effect was that the Roman Catholic Church in Germany became subject to this same dictation. Or perhaps it's more proper to say that the Ultramontanes immediately inaugurated measures to put it under the dominion of the papacy. 
One of the most efficient of these was the assertion of the right to teach the doctrine of papal infallibility in the public schools of the state and thereby impress the minds of every Roman Catholic youth that with the idea that instead of owing their first duty to Germany, they owed it to the Pope, from whom, notwithstanding any law of the state, they were bound to accept everything concerning religion and the church as absolutely and infallibly true. They put themselves accordingly in direct hostility to the civil authorities of the, com of the country, of the empire, and by doing so, forged large numbers of their church who desired to remain obedient to the laws and were ex were opposed to the doctrine of infallibility to separate themselves from the papal organization under the name of old Catholics. Okay, so this, this re resulted even in a split in the Roman Catholics, and this is what I've said before. Just as the old Catholics separated themselves and held to the idea that the state had legitimate jurisdiction over civil affairs and the papacy should restrict its activities to the spiritual leadership of the Pope, leave the governing to the people, to the duly elected government of the country, that the Pope should just butt out and they resisted this doctrine of papal infallibility and his usurpation of the civil government. And thus they were called old Catholics. Okay? The, the, uh, under the influence of the Protestant Reformation, essentially. That they, like the Protestants, agreed that the civil power should be uh, a servant of the people and not a servant of the Pope they were not willing to give up their government and overthrow their government to raise the papacy to supremacy. So they, get, they, 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 they were called old Catholics. Now, among these were some of the most distinguished and learned professors of the German universities, who were followed by many of their pupils and by others, who were convinced that the force of their arguments was, if they, was that if they put themselves in the power of the Ultramontanes, of the Jesuits, and accepted the doctrine of the Pope's infallibility, they would occupy necessarily a position of antagonism to the government. In other words, they didn't want to fight with their government. They liked their government. If they put themselves on the side of papal infallibility, then they would have to accept a position of opposition to the government that they loved. All right, all these people, all these old Catholics were excommunicated by the Pope, and one of the questions which the government had to meet was to decide upon the effect of this act. The Pope and the Ultramontanes insisted that it cut off all the excommunicated from the Christian intercourse and from the right to perform any Roman Catholic Church functions, whatever. The public authorities thought and decided otherwise and gave them the full protection of the law in maintaining their organization, which they claimed to be precisely in accordance with that which prevailed in the Roman Catholic Church in the ages before it was corrupted by the papacy. Other events contributed to make the breach still wider. There is a military church in Cologne where a priest who refused to accept papal infallibility and was under the ban of excommunication with the old Catholics, I will add the words, offered the sacrifice of the Mass. Now, they were forbidden to perform anything, any function of the church being excommunicated. Now, it says, for this, the Roman Catholic Church was placed under interdict by the ultramontane by the Jesuit chaplain general of the army who claimed that by virtue of his Episcopal office he had the right to prohibit the use of the building, the building that they occupied for any other worship than that which had the approval of the Pope. 
Okay? So they're kicked out of the building. These old Catholics were kicked out of the building. And it says, for this he was tried by them. This, this, this old Catholic who was allowed to serve Mass, it says, for this he was tried by a military court for a violation of the Articles of War and his Episcopal functions suspended. The Bishop of Emmerland excommunicated two professors of theology as apostates, and the Minister of Worship denied him the right to cut them off from Christian communion without the consent of the state. See, here we, we have another example of the church being pitted against the state and vice versa. The state was in defense of these so-called old Catholics. And it says the bishop, still defying the authorities, was deprived of his government salary. Okay, this is this is... This is what we're going to see in the United States of America. And it says the Emperor William sent Cardinal Hohenlohe uh, as an ambassador to the court of the Pope, and the Pope refused to receive him. The excitement became more and more intensified every day until the government convinced that the Jesuits were the prime movers in all the acts of resistance to its authority issued a proclamation on the 4th of July, 1872, expelling all foreign Jesuits from the empire and providing that those who were natives should have their places of residence prescribed to them. <laughs> I hope it was jail. Okay? Now look what happened. The German people, the German government rose up and kicked out the Jesuits because the Jesuits were leading the Roman Catholics into rebellion against the government for the purpose of elevating the Pope to the supreme governor of the land under the guise of papal infallibility, God on earth. The government kicked the Jesuits out of the country. Might that also be a solution for the United States today? Isn't this the lesson that R.W. Thompson's attempting to teach us? We must understand that every Jesuit priest, yea, every Roman Catholic priest, whether he be Jesuit or otherwise, takes his first oath of, of, of allegiance to the Pope of Rome. They are, first of all, citizens of Vatican City, and they are, first of all, under his temporal and spiritual authority that rises above every civil and spiritual authority on the earth. Where does that put them in relation to our government? And I want my listeners to see just how important it is for us to take note of how many Roman Catholics are in our government, in every level of our government, in every level of business, every level of banking, Who's in charge of the ecumenical movement that has taken over the Protestant churches? It's these ultramontanes, these Jesuits. Every Jesuit priest, every Roman Catholic priest, is part of the shadow government of the Pope. Swearing their first allegiance to a foreign potentate. <clears throat> who, claiming papal infallibility, asserts himself as the supreme law of the land. And any government that stands in his way, any law promulgated by that government that restricts or in any way hinders the power of the Pope to exercise his full and unfettered office as the representative of Jesus Christ on the earth is to be put down. Every Roman Catholic priest in this country, of whatever frock he wears, is a foreign agent. And as Christopher Strunk so eloquently said on the program many, many months ago, they should be registered under the Logan Act. 
their whereabouts should be recorded and followed. And when they preach anything that is opposed to our form of government, they should be evicted from the country as a, a spy for a most hostile foreign agency, the papacy. We've been asleep in this country. We didn't even know who the enemy was. But now you do. If you're a listener to Inquisition Update, particularly a regular listener to Inquisition Update, you know who the enemy is. You know who the domestic terrorists are. They are not fundamentalist, uh, Bible-believing Christians. Fundamentalist Bible-believing Christians are the salt of the earth. We don't kill anybody. We don't overthrow anybody's government. We keep to the Scriptures and we keep to Christ and we preach peace. But not at any price. There's a limit. And that limit is broached when the Pope asserts his right to govern us because he is not our king. He is not our savior. He did not die for us, and he cannot save us. And when he or his priests preach another message than this, that Christ is the full supreme power in the heavens and on earth and over the gates of hell, and not the Pope. The Pope is nothing but his usurper, his counterfeit, then they deserve no right to serve in our government. No Roman Catholic priest should be an advisor to any civil authority from the local city board, mayor, city administrator, school board, police department, nothing. Until they renounce their allegiance to the Pope and they renounce their, their, their citizenship of Vatican City and Rome and take their allegiance to the country and to the Constitution that gives them the liberty to preach this revolution, then they are to be denied any function in our government. The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Get a copy. Get two. And get them fast, because they're being gobbled up. It's one of the most important books in my library. On July 4th of 1872, they expelled all foreign Jesuits from the empire, and providing that those who were natives, those Jesuits who were natives, should have their places of residence prescribed to them. <laughs> I know where I would prescribe their residences in this country, in the concentration camps that they've made for me. Now, this was done pursuant to a law passed by the German Reichstag. Now, you know why they blew up the Reichstag, don't you? The Reichstag was the, the governmental authority of the German government that kicked these Jesuits out. And that's why after the, 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 during the Second World War, they blew up, or, or to begin the, the Second World War, they blew up the source of their fury, the Reichstag. It was the Jesuits and the Ultramontanes. It was payback time, so they blew up the Reichstag. Says this was done pursuant to a law passed by the German Reichstag, which was ultimately interpreted to embrace other monastic orders and, con and congregations which had yielded to the pressure of the Ultramontane influence, such as the Redemptorists, the Lazarus, the Trappists, and the Christian Brothers, etc. All this was called persecution, of course, 
And yet these acts of the government were domestic remedies against disloyalty. They were adopted in defense of the laws of the state, and it is in that view alone that they are now considered. Whether they were politic or not was exclusively for the, gov for the German government to decide, but the Pope and the Ultramontanes did, n did not so regard them. In their view, they were an invasion on the Pope's jurisdiction. They demanded that the Pope represented God and that Emperor William represented the state. The latter should, in, should permit the former, that is, William, Emperor William, should permit the Pope to enter his dominions as a domestic prince and dictate what laws concerning the church, its faith, and its priesthood should be executed and what should be disobeyed. That was and is today the sole question of controversy between the German Empire and the papacy, just as it is between the papacy and all other governments, the United States included. So that's the controversy. It's never talked about on Fox News, of course. Neither CNN or MSNBC or any of the other mainstream medias and as you will well note, as you're lis listening to Inquisition Update, you're also listening to many other alternative media sources. And Inquisition Update and First Amendment Radio is the only ones that really spell it out. It's just not talked about. The ultimate, the ultimate decision to be made in the United States of America by Christians... Choose you this day who you will serve. Will you serve Christ or the Pope? They're diametrically opposed. And as you choose, as you make that choice to serve Christ or Antichrist, so will go your government. If you choose Christ, you will maintain your liberty. If you acquiesce to the ecumenical movement and receive the Pope you will go under papal tyranny, the old world order. And they call it new, progressive. <laughs> Time to wake up. Come back tomorrow, and we'll shed more light on this new world order of the Pope through facts of history, thanks to R.W. Thompson. We'll see you tomorrow on Inquisition Update. Thanks for listening.